theorist versus experimentalist. This is cosmology. There are things we cannot yet study directly through experimentation. We can land on Mars, but we can't yet land on Proxima b. And there are environments we may never be able to experiment with, such as the interior of the event horizon of a black hole or the surface of a neutron star. But sometimes the line between experimentalist and theorist can blur if direct evidence can be obtained. My guest today led an expedition to gather physical evidence of interstellar material in the form of meteoritic spherules. This has been done before. Decades ago, the father of meteoritics, H. H. Nininger, dragged a magnetic rake across the Arizona desert, collecting droplets of the Canyon Diablo meteorite that was the impactor of the now famous Behringer Crater, our best preserved meteorite crater here on Earth. These droplets were from the vaporization of a portion of that iron asteroid. For a time after the impact, it would have rained molten iron in the immediate area as evidenced by the nickel iron spherules. But as far as other recovered spherules, in 2018 a meteorite entry was recorded over the Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary, and scientists from the NOAA were able to sweep the ocean floor and recover spheral material from that bolide. My guest today did just that, seeking evidence for a bolide that entered the Earth's atmosphere off the coast of Papua New Guinea at a velocity consistent with that of an object of interstellar origin. And he found it, and the material evidence is very strange indeed. You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Professor Avi Loeb. Avi Loeb is a Frank B. Bird Junior Professor of Science at Harvard University, Chair of Harvard's Department of Astronomy, Founding Director of Harvard's Black Hole Initiative, and Director of the Institute for Theory and Computation within the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. He also chairs the Advisory Committee for the Breakthrough Starshot Initiative, serves as the Science Theory Director for all initiatives of the Breakthrough Prize Foundation, as well as chair of the Board on Physics and Astronomy of the National Academies. He is the author of four books and over 700 scientific papers. He is an elected fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Physical Society, and the International Academy of Astronautics. In 2012, Time selected Loeb as one of the 25 most influential people in space. Dr. Avi Loeb, welcome back to the program. Thanks for having me. It's a great pleasure to join you. Now, Doctor, within science, especially astrophysics, we have the concept of theorists versus experimentalists. Now, you cross that line by heading out to the ocean off the coast of Papua New Guinea to collect up spherules of what appears to have been an interstellar object. Do you think there is a gulf between experimentalists and theorists that should be bridged by more theorists going out and actually doing uh, experiments? Well, I was joking with my research group at Harvard one day when I said that what makes a theorist happy? And they couldn't guess. And I said, well, it's a, a situation where the, uh, there is no experiment to rule out the, the theorist's uh, theory. Because then you can still show off and uh, do intellectual gymnastics without being tested by the guillotine of experiments. Experiments basically cut the head of some theoretical ideas because they are up to the test and then the data could rule such theories out. And the reason I said that is because there is a whole culture of theoretical physicists that uh, basically focused on ideas that cannot be tested in recent decades, like extra dimensions, like string theory. And they're very happy to be in that situation because they can do mathematical gymnastics and impress each other that they're really smart by solving equations. But their ideas are not being tested and we can't really imagine in the near future a test. And unfortunately, that's not the way we progress in our scientific knowledge. 
The way physics gains new knowledge is by testing ideas against experiments, seeing which ones are validated, or allowing the experiment to provide knowledge without us expecting it. These are called anomalies. And uh, that has been true throughout history. That's true for kids. You know, when kids examine objects, they are doing it agnostically and they learn that they made mistakes in assuming things. That's the learning process. And I insist on science being a learning process, not reflecting our past knowledge. But when senior scientists become experts on a subject, they wish that all the past knowledge will be validated in the future so that they can maintain their stature. So naturally they resist new knowledge because it calls into question some of their past successes. I had a lunch just half a year ago with a string theorist and uh, I asked the string theorist, what is your most important paper? And he said, oh, it's a paper about supersymmetry. And I asked, okay, uh, but we now know from the Large Hadron Collider uh, that searched for supersymmetry and didn't find it, that uh, this theory of supersymmetry, which is a new symmetry of nature, uh, does not exist in the natural range of parameters that were originally conceived for it. And why would you be proud of a paper you wrote about a theory that was not validated by experiments? And he said, well, because it may be around the corner, maybe the next accelerator, will smash particles at higher energies and find it. Now, to me, that sounded just like the ultra-Orthodox community of Lubavitchers in Brooklyn, uh, Crown Heights, who believed that their rabbi, decades ago, will become the Messiah. And uh, that was a, a, a very appealing theory for them. They, it was so appealing that they built an apartment for their rabbi in Israel, because the belief is that once the Messiah arrives, that the, the Messiah will go to Israel. And they wanted him to find a toilet. So they built a, a copy, a replica of the apartment in, in, in Brooklyn that he had also in Israel, where he will come back as the Messiah. And uh, then he died. That was a fact, a data point. What was their response? Well, we just have to wait. Even though this data point violated the theory, they said, well, just like the string theory, it might be around the corner. Let's just wait. Now, the question is, what makes religious belief <laughs> different from science? Well, the obvious answer is that we should learn from experience, from experimental data, because otherwise we would be trapped in our illusions about reality. But it seems like psychologically, people are always trapped in illusions, irrespective of whether it's religion or science. And what I call for is to be open-minded enough to allow experiments to teach us. And, you know, maybe it's a sign of me getting older and seeing how many ideas were proven wrong, but I decided to lead an expedition to the Pacific Ocean to test an idea. And uh, because nobody else would do it otherwise, there was this meteor that was uh, discovered by U.S. government satellites back on January 8, 2014, and it was very unusual. It was uh, moving very fast. It was not bound to the sun, and moreover, outside the solar system, it was moving faster than 95% of all stars in the vicinity of the sun relative to the so-called local standard of rest, which is the frame of the Milky Way galaxy locally. So it was moving very fast, and also it maintained its integrity all the way down to the lower atmosphere of the Earth, even though it was moving so fast. And we concluded, together with my student, Amir Siraj, that this object was tougher than all space rocks that were catalogued by NASA over the past decade, tougher than iron meteorites. So that raised the possibility in my mind that uh, it may have been a Voyager-like meteor. Just imagine the spacecraft that we launched to interstellar space, Voyager, leaving the solar system and eventually colliding with a planet like the Earth. It would appear as a meteor, but of unusual material strength because it's made of stainless steel. An unusual speed because it was propelled by a rocket. So to find out <laughs> whether this interstellar meteor, the first interstellar object, 
ever discovered by humans based on its speed to find out whether it was artificial or natural in origin. We went there to the Pacific Ocean. I led an expedition of uh, about 28 people on a ship uh, called Silver Star. And we built a sled, a one meter wide device that had magnets on both sides. And we dropped it on the ocean floor, connected it with a cable to the ship that was fittingly called Silver Star. The length of the cable was uh, three miles. The ocean depth was more than a mile. And uh, we uh, had a region uh, that had a size of order seven miles that the Department of Defense defined as the location of the fireball of the meteor. And so we were searching for tiny droplets, uh, the, the size of a grain of sand that melted off the surface of the object when it was exposed to the immense heat from the fireball that surrounded it as it was moving through air. And it sounds like an impossible task to find these tiny marbles, millimeter in size, at a depth of a mile across a region of seven miles. But we did it. I was thrilled when I saw an image of the first one through the microscope that we had on the ship. And I hugged the person who saw it first and told me about it. And uh, I was the chief scientist on this ship. So immediately they called me up. And then I knew that if, if you find the, an ant in the kitchen, there must be many more out there. So sure enough, we found the many more such uh, tiny marbles that looked very distinct relative to their background, 50 of them on the ship. And then um, I, as I came back to the United States, I arranged for the materials that we collected to be shipped uh, to my home by FedEx. And that took a few days. I preferred not to carry those materials in my suitcase because I was worried that they might be the, the material might be lost uh, in customs. And so I got it a few days later. I realized it's not a significant delay because it took probably billions of years for this material to arrive to Earth. And so the few day delay is not a big deal. And then I brought them to the laboratory of uh, Stein Jacobson, my colleague at uh, the Earth and Planetary Science Department at Harvard. And he has uh, some of the best instruments in the world for analyzing the composition of these uh, spherules. And we studied the, the, those spherules, uh, 57 of them, less than a tenth of the total number that we have by now, which is 700. So a summer intern of mine uh, named uh, Sophie Bertram, she wanted to become a science journalist and she came to shadow my work during the summer. But uh, at some point she said that she might be happy to help us in the science. So I gave her tweezers and a microscope and she found uh, more than 600 additional spherules. Altogether, we have 700 now. And uh, we looked at 57 of them and found that they were concentrated along the meteor path. And moreover, I mean, those uh, spherules that came from the meteor, of course, there were background spherules that have nothing to do with the meteor. And we found them as well because we went to control regions that are relatively far away, but also far from uh, within the area of the, uh, that was defined by the Department of Defense, but far from the location of the meteor path, we did not find an enhancement. So we made a map that showed that uh, there was an enhancement, like excess spherules along the meteor path. And we found a special type of uh, spherules never seen before, only along the meteor path, those high yield regions where there were extra spherules added by the meteor to those from the background. Those from the background look just like solar system materials, I-type, S-type spherules, but we found a new type. We called it D-type for differentiated the spherules. They had an enhancement by factors of hundreds of uh, specific elements like beryllium, lanthanum, uranium. We called it Belau for those three elements. And they were enhanced by factors of hundreds up to a thousand for uranium relative to what you find in solar system materials, the standard of the solar system, which is represented by chondrites, uh, CI chondrites. And that's a, a, an amazingly large deviation. It's not just a factor of 10, as you often find 
in different environments within the solar system, if you look at the literature, that's what you find, that variations uh, by a factor of 10 up and down relative to the solar system standard. We found up to a thousand times more uranium and other elements, and that made us conclude that we found those below spherules that represent molten droplets from the first uh, interstellar meteor, and it came from interstellar space, not just because of its high speed, based on its high speed, but also based on its composition. And it's the first time that scientists analyzed materials from a large object that came from outside the solar system. In this case, more than half a meter in size. Now, let's take the elements that are in the interesting spherules. Beryllium. That's weird. <laughs> seeing, seeing, seeing that much beryllium, what do you think is the origin of that? I mean, how do you end up with a concentration of beryllium like that? Right, so beryllium, I believe, is a flag for interstellar travel because very small quantities of beryllium were created in the Big Bang. And most of the additional beryllium is produced by cosmic rays, energetic particles that are breaking heavier nuclei. This is called spallation. In interstellar space, there is some flux of cosmic rays that would break nuclei as it impacts on the surface of an object traveling and would create an enhancement of beryllium compared to rocks that are in the inner solar system because those rocks in the asteroid belt, the asteroids, you know, they are protected from most of the cosmic rays that, that come from the Milky Way galaxy because they are blocked by the heliosphere, the solar wind, interface with the interstellar medium. The magnetic fields there just don't allow the cosmic rays in, most of them. And so you would find, naturally, an enhanced level of beryllium by traveling through interstellar space. The surface of the object from where the droplets originated was enriched in beryllium, probably as a result of that. The other heavier elements are a mystery. And I can talk about various ways to enhance them if you wish. Yes, actually, by all means. So what is it, it's beryllium? Lanthanum and uranium. Well, and, we'll get to uranium. And many yeah, elements lanthanum. between yeah. lanthanum and uranium. One environment that can make those enhanced abundances of heavier elements is a magma ocean. Basically, a planet that reaches such a high temperature that the rock melts, uh, sort of like a lava o uh, ocean, a uh, magma ocean. And then... Um, if such a planet has a core that is made of iron, then something interesting happens. And by the way, the Earth started as a magma ocean because it was bombarded early on by objects colliding with it. One of them created the moon. And the moon was a magma ocean because it came from a magma ocean to start with. Mars was a magma ocean for the same reason, the large heavy bombardment. And so we know that magma ocean planets existed uh, because uh, the, the local ones were. But if you allow uh, for a long enough time, what happens in a magma ocean that some of the elements have affinity to iron. So if the planet has an iron core, these elements sink and attach to the iron in the core. And they leave behind other elements of the type that we had seen between lanthanum and uranium and that's called differentiation. So you could have, in principle, you can make the crust of a planet that has an iron core and a magma ocean, you can make it rich in um, those elements that we had seen. But the abundance pattern that we found in the spherules, there were five of them in the high yield region around the meteor path, those cannot be matched uh, by any of the environments we know of in the solar system, not the Earth, not uh, the Moon, not Mars, and not uh, the asteroids, which are basically some rocks that were used in the buildup of uh, the planets in the solar system. So it must have originated from some other magma ocean, if that's the origin, that's, uh, that uh, had different circumstances there. And I'm still thinking about this idea. Uh, the challenge here is that you need about 10 to the power 23 pieces like this meteor per star because uh, that is needed to explain one of them colliding with Earth every decade. And this number is very big. If you take each piece to have uh, 500 kilograms like 
this meteor had, and you have 10 to the power 23 of them per star, you end up with the mass of the Earth per star. So basically, you need to take a huge amount of mass uh, similar to that, that of the Earth, break it up to 10 to the power 23 fragments. And uh, all of them should originate from a magma ocean that uh, enri was enriched at the level that we see in its crust. And you know that doesn't sound easy to do with the kind of processes that we are familiar with in the solar system. Another possibility for a natural origin would be the ejecta from a, an exploding star, a supernova, or a collision of two neutron stars. But it turns out that if you imagine fragmentation in, into rocks uh, out of those uh, ejecta, they could lead to an overabundance of some of the elements we see, but not all of them. The, the ones that they can bring to the mix are called the R process elements, rapid process, but they cannot explain what is called S process elements that are slow process where the production process is slower because the bombardment by neutrons is weaker. And those S process elements are produced by asymptotic giant branch AGB stars. So you need really different astrophysical sources to account for the combination, the mix of those two groups of elements. And that sounds more difficult to arrange in large quantities. And finally, there is the possibility that maybe it's technological in origin because some of these elements are being used in technological devices. Uh, for example, semiconductors, they have substrates that involve a lanthanum and, and, and some of the other elements that we see. And of course, uranium is used in fission reactors. So who knows in terms of technology, you know, one thing I'm thinking about is just like a recipe for a cake, where if you know the ingredients and you know how much of each uh, you have to add to the mix, you can in principle bake a cake. And I can imagine in a laboratory experiment where we will take those elements that we found with the right proportions that we find in these spherules and put them together and try to make a cake, try to reproduce this, the material that made this uh, first interstellar meteor and see if it has special properties. Does it have an unusual melting point? Does it have an unusual thermal conductivity, an unusual electric conductivity? Is it a superconductor at room temperature? Is it something really unusual? That would be interesting to check. But the best way to tell if it's technological or natural would be to find a big piece of that object. And we are currently planning the next expedition to go back to that site. Now we know where to look because we found these concentrations of spherules along the meteor path. So the big pieces should be just around there. And we are planning to go there and search for bigger pieces with a completely different machinery than we use. It will not be a sled. It will probably be a sonar that will image the ocean floor and look for pieces that are of interest. And of course, we should be able to tell the difference between a rock and a technological gadget if we see a piece, because a, a, a large piece of a gadget may show buttons on it. The profound. So any of the three options here is profound. So if it is a piece of a lava exoplanet, then you get an insight into the formation of star systems. And the early days, this would have presumably been something just after the protoplanetary disk stage of a star system somewhere out there in the galaxy. If it is technological, then we just found evidence of an alien civilization existing at some point in the past. And if it's a supernova bullet, then <laughs> we have a probe into supernova, you know? So any way you go in this, in this you, you come up against something very profound in astrophysics and you have evidence, you have material from something that we have never seen before. And, and there it is, study it, it's right there. Spherals, do you see this as a budding area of science? Do you think that others are gonna go out and say, well, right. let's look at other areas of the ocean floor where there might have been meteorite falls? Do you, do you think you've started a field? Yeah, I think that's very exciting because, you know, in astronomy to find out what lies outside the solar system for, you know, centuries, astronomers used telescopes. And here we are using microscopes, a very different approach. So the method, the tools we are using are quite different. 
And moreover, suppose we could date the duration of the journey using radioactive isotopes. I, I realized when I was on the ship something interesting that if we knew the duration of the journey and multiplied it by the velocity of the object when it was outside the solar system, we could get the distance from where it came. We know the direction, we know the distance. So in principle, we could have localized its uh, source star. That's something that was never available in astronomy to figure out where something came from because actually we didn't see any object yet big enough that would tell us that you know it came uh, from another astrophysical source. So it's really exciting if, if we ever manage to date the, the age of the material uh, within that, uh, these spherules that we found, and we can talk more about it. But um, another thing, uh, of course, is the speed of the object outside the solar system was 60 kilometers per second. That's uh, twice as large as the typical speed of stars in the vicinity of the sun, and it represents uh, a speed that is faster than 95% of the stars relative to the local standard of rest, as I mentioned. And the question is, what kind of source would give you that speed? So it's not just the abundance, 10 to the 23 of these objects, also the composition that uh, requires a magma ocean, but it's also the speed. You need to launch them at a relatively high speed. And I have some ideas, actually, that I'm currently exploring. It cannot be a, a standard uh, planetary system in its early days uh, around a star like the Sun. You don't get such things moving so fast. So it's such a large number of them. So I'm, I'm currently working on one possible scenario, but I don't know if it will work. And then, of course, in terms of technology, that would be really fascinating. What I would like to know is, you know, if we find a large piece, does it have a postal stamp on it so we can tell where it came from? Now, the question of age. Now, with uranium particularly, you're dealing with half-lives and certain isotopes and things like that. Is there a way to date these spherules and see when they came about? Yeah, so one thing I did not mention is when we look at the composition of these spherules, um, the special ones, the Bela ones, there is a lack of elements that are volatile that can uh, be lost uh, as a result of evaporation during the hot phase of the fireball. And indeed, we don't find them. So that implies, indeed, the, the spherules that we call Belau are associated with an airburst, an explosion that presumably is linked to IM-1, this first interstellar meteor. By the way, I, I called it originally, I wanted to save uh, space in the paper we wrote with uh, my student Amir Siraj. So I said, why don't we call it IM-1, abbreviating first interstellar meteor? But now I realize that, in fact, um, it sounds like IM-1. I am one of a population of objects. That's the message that this object brought to us. <laughs> and of course, we have a second uh, candidate, uh, I am two, the second interstellar meteor. And that sounds like I am two, a, a member of this population. <laughs> so uh, that's interesting. And also I should mention this week, the same week that we posted our preprint for the paper on the archive and also submitted it for publication, my new book came out titled Interstellar, and the, the title of the book is actually the punchline of the paper, which is a complete coincidence because the book was uh, completed uh, months ago, and when we came back from the expedition, I expected us to complete the paper uh, at the end of July, a month earlier, but um, we, it just took more time for us to go through the analysis more carefully and analyze enough, a large enough number of uh, spherules. Of course, we could have continued to do that, but I decided it's best to put out the results after a tenth of the sample was analyzed, just in case people in the community at large, the scientific community, give us comments that would help us analyze the rest of the sample. I didn't want us to analyze a substantial fraction of the sample, like half of the spherules, and only then report the results because it might be too late for us to do something differently. But coming back to your question, one thing we see is indeed the lack of volatile elements and among them is lead. And uh, if one considers uranium, various isotopes of uranium decaying, you know, there is uh, uranium-235 
uh, and it decays with a half-life of 0.7 billion years. And uranium-238 decays with a half-life very similar to the age of the solar system, 4.6 billion years. And that's, uh, these are very used, uh, useful clocks because the journey through the Milky Way galaxy probably lasted billions of years. The only problem is the decay products are isotopes of lead and we lost the lead during the fireball phase. So we can't really use this clock. And uh, another clock that one can think of is thorium, but it also suffers from the same problem. And um, there are other radioisotopes, uh, radioactive isotopes that uh, decay with shorter lifetimes, half-lives of tens of millions of years. I have a list of them. So perhaps the next step for us is to measure isotopes with high precision and we will try to use some of them as clocks if possible but um, it's not clear that it, it will be successful because these measurements are very challenging. So you go back out and you look for the main mass. Does that change the equation? In other words, when you have a spheroid that's been stripped off and gets depleted in certain things because it's, it's basically been vaporized, does that mean that if you go out and actually find a fragment, a, you know, a large piece of IM1, could you then expand on this and, and actually see the lead? The lead is not lost in the main mass, right? Yeah, that's a, an excellent point. And indeed, the, that would be another benefit, uh, aside from just knowing what the source object was based on a large piece, you're right, that we can find its true composition uh, not on the surface that was exposed to the fireball, but deep inside where we didn't lose the volatile elements. And if, if I imagine us reconstructing IM1 in the laboratory by uh, putting together the, the ingredients uh, in that uh, recipe book that we constructed, then knowing the volatiles as well is quite important because otherwise we have to guess how much content this object had in those lost uh, elements. So if we find a big piece, as you are saying, we could definitely understand the origin, the source of this uh, object much better. Looking for the main mass off the coast of Papua New Guinea, would this require a different approach than the sled? Yes. So you're going to have to be looking for something very different this time. What are the ideas there? How would you look for the main mass uh, or main masses of IM-1? Yeah, so the sled is a very primitive approach where we just dragged on the ocean floor a piece of metal. We didn't have in real time a view of what the sled is going through. We had video cameras taking images as we were moving, but and, and then we analyzed them retroactively after bringing the, the sled on deck. A, a much a better approach at picking up a small or larger pieces would be to have a view of what where we are at any given time and use a device that can pick up those pieces. And, for that, we want to image the floor, most likely with a sonar that gives us the resolution we need, depending on its frequency, bouncing sound waves. Obviously need a, a way of picking up bigger objects. And so we are currently discussing various options. We haven't converged yet. And once we decide which, which of these uh, tools are best for us to use, you know, we will uh, know the price tag and then we need to get uh, the funding for this. The important point is we need to see objects that are big enough, but also be able to tell the difference between a terrestrial rock, something like a, a, a basaltic rock that came from some volcanic activity and a, a rock that came from the sky. I mean, the two types can be differentiated based on their properties like density or composition but um, we have to develop the tools we haven't yet done it and the hope is that we will have the next visit to that uh, region of the meteor within the coming year looking for im2 which is in a very different area of the ocean and completely halfway across the world now what is the progress there is there any any plans of an expedition to go and see if you find something similar you know, uh, can you reuse the sled? Can you go? Can you go off the coast of uh, what is it, Portugal? I think. 
can you go do that and, and do the same thing and reuse the sled? Yeah, we can do that. <laughs> the ocean depth there is about three miles, so three times larger than uh, near Papua New Guinea. So the cable will need to be longer. Uh, it might be more challenging. It's easier to get a ship in that uh, region because it's close to Europe. So there are benefits and challenges there. We also don't have confirmation about the interstellar origin of IM2 from uh, the US Space Command. Uh, so there is some uncertainty about that. And the material strength was number three in the CNEOS catalog that NASA compiled of meteors, whereas IM1 was number one. So there was a, another meteor in between the two that was tougher than IM2, but less uh, tough than IM-1. So IM-2 is not as spectacular in terms of its potential for being something unusual other than uh, you know, iron, uh, an iron meteorite. But we want to look at it, and it was definitely among the toughest in the catalog, uh, the number three out of 273. But IM-1 is much more intriguing also in terms of its speed, because IM-2 was moving at a speed that can be accommodated by nearby stars. Now on toughness, so I am one, it was very tough material, whatever it was. Given that you're dealing with, you know, spherules that were stripped off during entry, what you have left, is that consistent with an object that would be really hard at, that would uh, be in line with the data from the, uh, the government satellite? Right. So in fact, a couple of months ago, there was um, a paper published in the Astrophysical Journal, where astronomers argue that they cannot match the data from the U.S. government because uh, they are, if they are using a model for the known meteors, meteorites uh, made of stone or iron, either way, the data must be wrong because they cannot match it. And they argue that the velocity must be three times smaller than reported by the U.S. Space Command. And, you know, that's a very bold claim because... The U.S. Space Command gets more funding than NASA and is supposed to report to the President of the United States if there is a ballistic missile heading our way. Obviously, if they made mistakes by a factor of three, uh, we are wasting our taxpayers' money. And I wouldn't sleep well at night knowing that. Nevertheless, that's the claim made two months ago in the Astrophysical Journal. And, you know, I believe the measurement of the U.S. Space Command because uh, they wrote an official letter to NASA confirming that at the 99.999%, this interstellar meteor was indeed uh, of interstellar origin. And that's why we went to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, I believe them. And we went there and we found those spherules, below spherules, of an extrasolar composition. So that confirms this their assessment, and I sleep better at night. But on the day that I came back from the expedition... This paper appeared in the Astrophysical Journal just to show that um, some astronomers want everything in the sky to be stones of a familiar type, the stones that we had seen before. We already know that's uh, not true because we know that 83% of uh, matter in the universe is of some unknown substance that we've never witnessed in the solar system. It's called dark matter. <laughs> we've been trying to figure it out uh, without success. But one thing we know for sure, that there is a substance out there that is not represented by stones. And of course, if the astronomers were taking the same view as those that wrote about IM1, uh, they would have said, oh, the data on the rotation curves of galaxies on cosmology must be wrong because, because we cannot fit it with stones. And obviously, that's a very narrow-minded view because much of cosmology is focused on figuring out the dark matter. I'm not saying that this IM1 is of a substance that was never seen before. We see the elements that are familiar to us. It's ordinary matter. But claiming that it must be stone and therefore the data must be wrong is very arrogant. And uh, we should be ready or open-minded to new knowledge, uh, learning that things that arrive to us from outside the solar system could be quite different from what we had seen before. You know, you could potentially see a tennis ball thrown by a neighbor that doesn't look like the rocks in your backyard. So history repeats itself. So when when we were first 200 years ago, over 200 years ago, when when the debate on whether meteorites exist was going on, 
I remember Thomas Jefferson said that he would rather believe that two Yankees would lie than stones would fall from heaven based on a meteorite fall in Connecticut at the time. So this has happened before. There was a time where science, the consensus, did not believe that rocks fell from space. Not that long ago. And they do, obviously. So here we're getting into a subset. Do rocks fall from interstellar space is the question now. And it just seems to me that that it, it isn't that far of a stretch to say yes they do you know that that there is interstellar material in the solar system because nothing prevents it nothing in physics prevents it so by looking at these and and beginning to wonder about things like molten planets you know and materials getting blasted off them it happened here there are precedents for all of this so it's not really a very big stretch to say yeah we're going to find stuff like this landing on the planet right the other thing we should keep in mind is that, you know, we sent five probes over the past uh, cent uh, half century to interstellar space. Uh, that was uh, Voyager 1, Vo uh, Voyager 2, Pioneer 10, Pioneer 11, and New Horizons. And once they exit the Oort cloud at the outskirts of the solar system, they will not be functional anymore. And they will be space trash. So we are polluting interstellar space with trash. Since we came late to the party, I mean, most stars formed billions of years before the sun. We know that from the cosmic star formation history. That means, uh, and it takes half a billion years for uh, rockets of the type that we launched to cross the Milky Way galaxy. You know, it's quite possible that interstellar space is full of these debris, space trash objects. Uh, you know, just like the oceans are full of plastics, they keep accumulating over time. So over the past billions of years, a lot of space trash from technological civilizations may have populated interstellar space because they're bound by gravity to the Milky Way galaxy. Every now and then, one of those objects would collide with Earth. So that's the way to think about it. Of course, there could be also functional devices that have a, a brain, that artificial intelligence that guides them under changing circumstances because they have no time to wait for guidance from the senders. It takes um, thousands of years for, or even tens of thousands of years, depending on where the sender is within the Milky Way galaxy, for light signals to arrive. So if the probe uh, faces a decision, it cannot wait for guidance. It has to decide on its own. You know, it's very different from what we encounter sending uh, probes to Mars, for example. Now there is the Perseverance rover and the Ingenuity helicopter over there, but they are managed by engineers in the Jet Propulsion Lab of, of NASA in Pasadena. And I call that uh, helicopter parenting uh, because, uh, well, first of all, they manage a helicopter, but uh, moreover, they just tell those the gadgets what to do, just like helicopter parents tell their kids what to do. You cannot do that in an interstellar journey. It takes too much time for signals to cross the distance. And so you need gadgets if you want them to be functional. You need them to be autonomous, to have their own brain in the form of artificial intelligence. And that's what I think we would find if we were to encounter a functioning device it's very unlikely that it would carry biological creatures because the journey is very long, takes millions to billions of years, and biology just cannot survive for that long being exposed to cosmic rays and lack of nutrients. Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice.